Hi, this is Ed Driscoll. Welcome to Silicon Graffiti. At the time of his death in early 2005, at the venerable age of 98, Philip Johnson was arguably America's best-known architect. If you live in America and Bauhaus did come to your house, you can largely thank Johnson, who almost single-handedly created the architectural department of New York's Museum of Modern Art shortly after its founding in 1929. But in the 1930s, Johnson was sort of the real-life version of Woody Allen's Zelly character, moving fluidly in the radical left-wing politics of the era, from socialism to national socialism to populism, and back to national socialism in less than a decade, a period that he later almost entirely airbrushed from his past. Well, at least while he was alive, here's how Charlie Rose introduced him on the occasion of Johnson's 90th birthday. I am pleased to have Philip Johnson here for an hour as he celebrates this day, his 90th birthday. Since being in New York, he's one of the people that I enjoy the most, whose friendship I cherish, and who in 90 years has lived a life that many of us can envy because of its activism, because of its energy, because of its contribution, and because of the people's lives in his profession and outside of his profession that he has influenced. Jonah Goldberg's best-selling liberal fascism spends a considerable amount of time opening up the memory hole and shining a light on the lost history of the 1930s, a time when virtually all of history's isms, communism, fascism, populism, socialism, and national socialism were interconnected and highly seductive to the intellectuals of the time. Philip Johnson was another. He did help transform his friend, Germany's Mies van der Rohe, the last director of the Bauhaus before the Nazis shut its doors, into the most influential modern architect in America after Mies fled from the Nazis in 1937. But Johnson himself was surprisingly comfortable with the Nazis during the same decade, even as they were persecuting artists whose aesthetics didn't mesh with their own, such as Mies. In his 1995 profile of Johnson for Commentary magazine, Hilton Kramer wrote that in the 1920s, Johnson, already then quite a wealthy young man due to investments he inherited from his father, discovered the writings of Frederick Nietzsche while at Harvard, which would come to dominate his political thinking. In 1932, Johnson published, along with Henry Russell Hitchcock, Jr., The International Style, Architecture Since 1922, the book that accompanied the first major exhibition of modern architecture in the U.S., and still in print over 75 years later. The combined exhibition and book put modern architecture on the map in the U.S., and dramatically boosted the reputations of the European avant-garde architects whose works were featured, including France's Le Corbusier and Germany's Marcel Breuer, Walter Gropius, who was the founder of the Bauhaus, and especially Mies, whom Johnson was soon hired to design his own New York apartment, a photograph of which appeared in the book. But one year later in Germany, Hitler came to power, and Johnson, who spoke German fluently, felt his own Nietzschean urges flowing. As Hilton Kramer wrote in 1995, quote, There is no other way to put it. Johnson fell in love with the Nazi regime, unquote, apparently after witnessing a Nazi rally in Potsdam while traveling through Europe in 1933. That Hitler was a sworn enemy of all modern art, and as a failed architect harbored a special hatred for modern architecture, seemed to do little to phase Johnson. If in the arts Germany sets the clock back now, it will run all the faster in the future, Johnson wrote at the time. A year later, when Johnson returned to the States, he resigned his post as director of the nascent Museum of Modern Art's architectural department and moved from fascism to populism, attempting to join up with Louisiana's Huey Long. It's actually not that big of a swing. Nazism is a sort of populist form of Marxism. Both are totalitarian regimes led by dictators. And as Jonah Goldberg noted in Liberal Fascism, Huey Long said at the time, there is no dictatorship in Louisiana. There is a perfect democracy there, and when you have a perfect democracy, it's pretty hard to tell it from a dictatorship. Failing to connect with Huey Long, Johnson moved on to Father Coughlin in early 1936. As Ann Applebaum wrote in the Washington Post shortly after Johnson's death, in one of the few MSM articles to strongly make the connections, quote, During that time, Johnson didn't merely sympathize with Nazism like Lindbergh or make a juvenile joke like Prince Harry. On the contrary, Johnson helped to organize a U.S. fascist party. He worked on behalf of the Nazi sympathizer and radio broadcaster Father Charles E. Coughlin, unquote. During that period, Coughlin gave a speech in which he told his audience, 
our government still upholds one of the worst evils of decadent capitalism, namely, that production must be only at a profit for the owners, for the capitalist, and not for the laborer. And in 1938, two years after Coughlin's presidential challenge to FDR fizzled, Johnson returned to Nazi Germany. In 1939, he wrote to a friend, I was lucky enough to get to be a correspondent so that I could go to the front when I wanted to, and so it was that I came again to the country that we had motored through, the towns north of Warsaw. The German green uniforms made the place look gay and happy. There were not many Jews to be seen. We saw Warsaw burn and Modlin being bombed. It was a stirring spectacle." Unquote. A year later, Johnson apparently applied for a job at the German embassy in Washington. Something must have gone horribly wrong because almost immediately thereafter, Johnson returned to Harvard and enrolled as a student in the School of Architecture at age 33, the 1930s behind him. Having the wealth to fund his own projects, Johnson quickly established himself as a known architect in his own right, designing his famed glass house in 1949 based largely on Mies van der Rohe's Farnsworth house, which Mies had already designed several years earlier, but his client had not yet built. But it would be Johnson's role as an architectural impresario, through which he really made his mark, having helped advance the careers of numerous up-and-coming architects. And in From Bauhaus to Our House, Tom Wolfe notes that Johnson's AT&T building, completed in 1984, now owned by Sony, did much to establish the architectural style of postmodernism. Thirty years earlier, though, in the mid-1950s, Johnson would team up with Mies himself to design the Seagram Building, one of the most influential modernist buildings of the 20th century. A few years ago, the BBC unearthed some footage of Susan Sontag visiting Johnson's office in the Seagram Building in the late 1950s or early 1960s. I moseyed over to Philip Johnson's modest stash on Park, the Seagram building gleamed like a switchblade in the autumn sun. The elevator swished up like a gigolo's hand on a silk stocking. This view is absolutely extraordinary. It's the best view in New York because we don't have any buildings across from us. See, everybody thinks it's wonderful to look into skyscrapers. It isn't because you just see how other people live at the same level you yes. are. It's the whole principle of the Corbusier, always wanting to build the buildings high all alone on a plane, then you get this feeling. But now, they're going to ruin our view down there. They're going to build a skyscraper just like that, right in front of us. Well, they are going to build Yeah, right, right there. there where those cars are. So it'll completely take out our view. And that can't be helped. New York is a chaos, and we enjoy it, so we get paid the penalty for it. There's some amazing retroactive synchronicity at work here. In 1975, Sontag would write an essay titled Fascinating Fascism for the New York Review of Books, on Lenny Riefenstahl's attempts to reclaim her reputation after her tour of duty as Hitler's favorite documentarian. Would Johnson have been happy to have been one of Hitler's architects, alongside, say, Albert Speer? As Applebaum noted, when Johnson was asked in 1993 whether he would have built buildings for Adolf Hitler in the 1930s, Johnson replied, quote, Who's to say? That would have tempted anyone. But Johnson had much better luck expunging his lost decade than Riefenstahl would, by the time of his obituary in the New York Times, Johnson's 1930s political misadventures through the various circles of the far left warranted less than a paragraph midway through his long and reverent obituary. Naturally, the Times credited his dalliances with Nazism, Huey Long, and Father Coughlin to, quote, a deeply mistaken detour into right-wing politics. In 1987, shortly before she passed away, Marga Barr, the wife of Alfred H. Barr, Jr., the founding director of the Museum of Modern Art, was asked by Hilton Kramer what she thought of Johnson's most recent works, including his then-recent proposal to redesign Times Square. I feel about Philip today the way I would feel about a beloved son who had gone into a life of crime, she told Kramer. For Silicon Graffiti, I'm Ed Driscoll.